Uh, good to see you guys this morning. I'm so glad that you guys are here. Looks like we got the remnant here this morning. That's great. You guys are the cream of the crop, yeah? Yeah, of course you are. Say amen, even though you don't say amen very often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm Scotty. I'm glad you guys are here. I'm the pastor of Brownwood Community Church. If I've not met you, I hope I get a chance to do that. Please catch me after the service. Uh, I would love to introduce myself to you and get to know a little bit about you and your story. Uh, we're in part two of our Advent series. Uh, if you're not, not familiar with those kind of terms, it's just Christmas series, right? Advent is about the coming of Jesus, the coming of our Savior. Okay, we look for a second Advent now too. Bill's going to talk about that a little bit in part four. In a couple of weeks, as we anticipate Christmas, we'll be talking about God's peace for the future and all of that. And uh, he's the right person to talk about that. So don't miss out on that. Bring your kids. It'll be a wonderful time. Gr Bill's a great storyteller. And so we're going to set him up to tell a great story. So you don't want to miss that sweet time right before Christmas. So uh, and look forward to being here during that time. So, but today, uh, like I said, is part two. And last week, if you missed last week, uh, you can watch it online at Facebook or YouTube. Uh, feel free to, to catch up with us. But it was kind of foundational. What I said last week is this, that we're talking about peace. It's called the Prince of Peace is the series. So we're talking about how to, how to discover peace and have that peace in your life. And I said this, I said, peace comes from letting God be God. And that sounds elementary and that may sound silly to say that uh, because like you would admit to at least to your spouse because they know the truth that you're not God, right? <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, she would, she would agree. But peace comes from letting God be God. In other words, not trying to play God, because that to me is the story of humanity. Uh, if we go all the way back to Genesis chapter three, where it talks about the, you hear about the fall of man, where sin entered the world and caused all the damage that we now see and experience in our world, the hurt, the pain, and so forth. To me, it goes back to there and, and it's, Interesting to look at that story in light of this statement that peace comes from letting God be God because I think uh, playing God as humans is really what sin is all about. So you think about the story in the garden where Satan shows up in the form of a serpent and he convinces Eve first, but Adam's right there with her to disobey God. And so if you're around church a lot, then, you know, people talk about sin being this just disobedience, okay? And I get that. I mean, disobedience is not a good thing. Look at your children and say, see, I told you, the preacher said it, so it's true. Disobedience is never a good thing. But, but there's more to the story than that. The, the original sin happened when, you know, S Satan convinced even Adam and Eve to do something. They were convinced by Satan to play God. When you read that story, it says that God told them very specifically, look, just don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then Satan comes along and he starts throwing things out and he says, well, you know, God said you would die, but surely you won't die. And here's what he said. And I'm paraphrasing, obviously. It's the Scotty version, yeah? So Satan says to Eve and Adam, because he's right there, Look, there's a reason God doesn't want you to eat from that tree. And what he says is that God knows, he puts this doubt about God in their mind, God knows that if you do, you'll be like him. In other words, you'll be equal to him or you'll be able to be God. And so when I look at original sin, sin as Paul would describe it, the apostle Paul, is way more than simple disobeying rules or doing the wrong thing, kind of, that you, you follow me? It's, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's humans trying to play God, trying to be their own God and distance themselves from God. It's not, sin is letting, not letting God be God. And that's what I'm getting at. And humans got it wrong, and we've been getting it wrong ever since. You notice? And, and, and I think that's the, the story of humanity goes along. Here, just give some examples. Wait, here's how we play God, okay? Some examples. We play God when we try to fix other people. Don't look at them because they know you do it, right? 
When you try to fix other people, control other people, manipulate other people, get what you want out of them or try to correct what you see to be wrong, trying to fix other people, that's when you play God. Or we play God when we judge other people. Because you were, you were not made, you were not created to sit in the seat of judgment. Only God can judge perfectly justly, right? So we play God when we judge other people. We play God when we try to control the future. We talked about that a little bit last week, right? Now, you can certainly impact your future, and that's something good to recognize, but trying to control the future, it just puts you in that state of anxiety and it's like frustration all the time if you try to control the future, okay? We play God when we think we own the truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, see, I'm 48 now, and when I was 35, buddy, I owned it. <laughs> like, you couldn't convince me of anything that I believed or anything that I thought or my perspective was anything but the truth. I was very black and white. When we think we own the truth, I think we're playing God, or we play God when we take revenge on someone. We want to make sure they get what's coming to them, that they get, they reap what they've sown. And God says, look, just leave it alone. Reaping and sowing and reaping, like that'll take place. I've set it up to be that way. So don't, you don't have to try to play God for people to get what they need to get. So you don't need to take revenge. And that sounds all well and good. And these are just a few examples that I came up with. There are many ways that we try to play God. But the problem with all of this, see, is that our faith is all about a relationship with our Heavenly Father through Jesus. And and we can't properly relate to God if we're trying to be God. See, the relationship was designed from the beginning to be the relationship between a, a father and a child or the creator himself and his creation, his creatures. And so if we're trying to play God, then it just, it it messes it all up and it gets in the way. And that's, again, that's kind of what's been happening over and over and over and over throughout human history is the the, the, the outflow of us trying to play God or at least trying to eliminate God from his position. And so moving forward, I have to think, okay, well, we did it. Look at your neighbor and say, it's your fault. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Look in the mirror and say, it's your fault. Yeah. (laughs) We did this, right? You know, it's easy to look out and to blame the White House or to blame other people, people that aren't like you or whoever, you know, that you don't identify with and and blame. But we did this. And so if we did this, we broke the relationship with God. So how do we make peace with him? How do we make peace with him? And it feels like, like throughout human history, you know, the, 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 the history of faith and religion and such, and people for, for all of human history have been trying to work this out. Somehow, how do I put myself in good standing with God? Or how do I fix things that are broken? How do I make the world a better place? How do I deal with the evil that I still see in our world, the brokenness and people hurting people and war? And like, so like, you don't have to look very far to find what's broken and what's wrong in our world. That's our story trying to make peace with God and make peace with one another somehow. And the thing is, is that what I love about the Christian faith is that it does make sense of everything, but it's not the way most people try to make it out to be. We're looking for how do we deal, how do we find solutions to the brokenness of our world. And, and see, the Christian faith has solutions, but they're messy, aren't they? And we don't like messy. I don't like messy. Like, my hair's always got to be darn just right, and, you know, my clothes got to fit just right. And, you know, I don't, I don't do messy very well. Ask the people who work with me. Like, <laughs> 
when things get out of control, out of my control, it's like I freak out a little bit and they all have to, Scotty, it's okay, breathe, breathe. We got this, you know? I don't like messy. And here's the thing, if, if you find clean, like nice and clean and tidy answers or solutions to all the, the problems that we all run into, like the big problems in the world and the brokenness of our world, if you find these nice, clean, tidy solutions, you've probably not found faith, you've probably found some religious system that tries to take the messiness out of it. And so when I'm talking about these kind of things, one of the places I like to go in Scripture to put things in better perspective on, uh, especially like how is God dealing with this and what's our part to play in this? How do we work this out and flesh this out and live this out in this broken, chaotic world? that we live in. And so I go to the book of Romans because, you know, uh, I'm a Paul nerd and you just have to forgive me for that. He wrote half the New Testament. Paul, Paul wrote Romans and there more than any place probably, he lays out kind of a good structure of how he sees what God has been up to since the fall you know, how he's been working in and through Jesus and then working in and through us to bring everything to the end or the completion that he is actually working towards. And that's where you can find that is in the book of Romans. So we're going to jump to the book of Romans in chapter five and see what Paul has to say. Look at what he says. Therefore, now look at this. He says, since we have been justified through faith, we... We have peace with God. Okay, in light of the story I just told you about the fall and the broken relationship and, you know, all of that, Paul says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what did we do here? Right? He just says, now, obviously, I know I'm jumping in the middle of the letter, but Paul says, no, look, we have peace with God and it's through our Lord Jesus Christ. We didn't do anything here. He starts by saying, since we have been justified through what? Through through faith. Through faith, we have peace with God. Since, Since we've been justified by our faith in Jesus, right? That means we have peace with God. And then he goes on, still talking about Jesus, through whom we have not only, you know, been justified, we've gained access by faith. He uses that word again over and over and over into this grace in which we now stand. Oh, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. What, Paul, what are you you saying? Here's In light of what I'm trying to say in this series, you can't make peace with God. Like, think about it. If we could have made peace with God, Jesus wouldn't have died. You can't make peace with God. You ever seen that? Have you all seen Forrest Gump? Like, am I dating myself too much here? I I love this. It's like one of the, the best movies ever in some ways. And, you know, Lieutenant Dan... That whole scene on the on the boat, and he's just like he's a double amputee from the war, and he's just mad at the world and mad at God, and he just has this whole scene of the the storm comes, and he's just yelling, screaming, and the next day suddenly he's made his peace with God. We don't make peace with God because we can't make everything right. The good news is that we don't have to. You can't make peace with God. Put your faith in Jesus. We just, that's what Paul just said. We have peace with God because we have faith in Jesus. He goes on, says, not only so, this seems random. And this is, I said last week, sometimes Paul frustrates, I mean, I love Paul, but he frustrates me sometimes because he says stuff and I'm like, dude, that don't work. Like, I don't know, I don't know where you get this stuff. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Can you say messy, messy, messy? 
right? Good holiday movie, if you know what I'm talking about there. Now, we glory in our, in our sufferings. Ah, that just seems crazy. He says, because, there's a reason, because we know that suffering produces something. Suffering produces perseverance. Did you know suffering can be productive? I know you don't want to hear that, but again, messy solutions are usually the right ones, right? It produces perseverance, perseverance character. That's a good thing. You want that for your kids when you're raising kids, right? Character and character. Look at this, hope. How did the whole thing last week where we talked about the fruits of the spirit and how important that is? You know, these are the kinds of things that are produced in us. And hope, see, hope is connected to peace because we're focusing on peace. And, and hope is about the future, right? Hope's about the future. Peace is about the present. And they're connected, see, because when we have hope for the future can give peace in the present. And see, Bill, this is on you. You know, when Bill talks about the future, coming of Christ, hope for the future, it'll help give peace in the present because you don't feel like you have to work it all out for yourself, that God's got this and God's working his plan. And then he goes on about hope. He says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Okay. Now, this next verse, the very next verse is, and I know I'll probably say this all the time, don't I? It's one of my favorite verses of Scripture in the Bible. Look at what he says. He says, you see, at just the right time, God in history, acting in history, was at just the right time, look at what he says, when we were still powerless, remember, we couldn't make peace on our own. When we were still powerless, Christ died for the, the good people. The people who had it figured out. The people who had their act together. The people who were able to, you ever heard the thing, well, God helps those for, to help themselves. That ain't in the Bible. That's not what he says. You know what he says here? At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the worthy. He died for the ungodly. What? Who did Jesus die for? The ungodly not only died for the ungodly, but out of his own mouth in Matthew, you can read it, he calls Matthew the tax collector. Tax collectors were so bad, they had their own category. They didn't even want to offend the sinners. They always said sinners and tax collectors so that the sinners wouldn't be f offended by being categorized with the tax collectors because they were the worst of the worst, right? Well, Jesus calls Matthew from behind his tax collector's booth, makes him one of his crew, and goes to his house and has a party. Well, guess who the tax collector hangs out with? The only people they can hang out with is other tax collectors. And the religious people come by and go, what is he doing hanging out with sinners? And Jesus confronts them and says, look, let me tell you something. I didn't come to call the righteous but sinners. In other words, you self-righteous punks, I didn't come to call you because you don't think you need someone like me. I came to call on and to call into my fold the sinners. He, Jesus died for the ungodly. And we don't expect that, do we? Like nobody does. And Paul, that's why Paul says this next. He says, well, very rarely... Like, hardly ever will, will anyone die for a righteous person. Though, yeah, for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. 
right? But God. <laughs> but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While, while we were still sinning, I see, you need to push up against the religion you were brought up in that tells you that, 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 that God helps those who help themselves and you somehow got to get your stuff together and figure it out. That, but because Paul, the greatest theologian to ever walk the face of the earth, in my opinion, says, while we were still sinners, in other words, while we were still sinning, Christ died for us. He died for us at our worst moment. Peace with God, check this out. Peace with God does not come from your ability to stop sinning. I'm going to say it again. I'm not sure y'all caught it. Peace with God does not come from your ability to stop sinning. Peace with God will cause you to stop sinning. I am, for the record, I am anti-sin. I don't misquote Scotty here. I do not like sin. Sin does damage. Sin kills. Kills relationships, kills families, it kills all kinds of ways. Sin is bad. But your peace with God does not come from your own ability to get it together and to stop sinning. Peace with God is from faith in Jesus, and that's the only way, only way you can have peace with God. So stop trying to make peace with God. He's already made peace with you. He's already made peace with you. And again, I know, I know our, our, our concept of God so is, is so infused with so much religion and legalism that we've been taught because we're in the sin management business and, and parents can be the worst. And sometimes pastors like me act like parents from the stage and they want to convince you, you need to stop sinning. You need to stop sinning. You need to stop sinning. It's putting the car before the horse. You ever heard that phrase before? No. Put your faith in Jesus. Start there. Stop trying to play God and, and put your life together on your own. God can do that, and he will do that if you'll just let him. If you'll get out of the way. So stop trying to make peace with God. You don't have to make it. It's already been made. So little humor here. So many of us has been taught a different version. Like, the, again, and it's with good intentions that we've been told, you know, stop sinning, stop sinning, stop sinning, like all this stuff, and we'll pick your sin. <laughs> Everybody has their favorites. And it's usually the one they think that we don't struggle with, that we, like, see it in other people, so we want to pick on that one, right? Or whatever. But we go around trying to, trying to work it out, trying to figure it out, trying to get ourselves together, trying to put ourselves to right, trying to make peace with God. And uh, uh, it's really about trying to appease God. And it's what my friend Bill likes to call BR. It's not BS, it's BR. Y'all know what that stands for? It's bovine residue. <laughs> it's the same thing. Peace doesn't come from you. That's why it's a fruit of the Spirit. It doesn't come from you. It only comes from inside you if the Holy Spirit is inside you by faith in Jesus. You see how that works. It's from God, and it's given to you. It's a gift that God gives you. Paul would say, yeah, okay, yeah, you're ungodly. Okay, you're a sinner. You're a whatever the label is that you think somehow keeps you far from God. Paul would say, you're a sinner. You're ungodly. Perfect. Because that's who Jesus died for. He, that's what he said. He said, Christ died for the what? Ungodly. 
Look at your neighbor and say, that's me. That's me. All right, so real quick, going to jump to, if you don't believe me yet, to Paul's other letter called Colossians. Here's what Paul says in Colossians. He says, and through him, speaking of Jesus, through him to reconcile to himself all things that includes us, whether things on earth or things in heaven. But look at this. I'm not lying. He says, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. He says, yeah. Yeah, once. Once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. See, sin is bad. But now, he would say, not anymore. No, because he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body. This is an event that happened to a man named Jesus of Nazareth. It reconciled you. God has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight. Did you catch that? Holy in whose sight? Holy in God's sight. Holy in God's sight without, what, wait, what? Without blemish and free from accusation. Without blemish, you don't have to worry. God sees you because of Jesus as holy. And then without accusation, you know, any voice, and I don't care whose voice it is, even if it's my voice, your parents' voice, another preacher, another preacher's voice, anybody's voice, the enemy's voice in your head, whatever it is, any voice which accuses you of not being good enough for God is a liar. That's the accusation that Paul is talking about. Peace with God is from faith in Jesus. And look, I don't know how else to say it. And some of you have probably been here long enough and you think, when is Scotty going to say something else? <laughs> right. I, that's all I got. Peace with God is faith in Jesus. And look, faith, it, it's simple, but it's hard. Faith it's messy. Because faith is seeing what you're up against and seeing the circumstances that you're living in, seeing the suffering that you're walking through and still trusting God. That God cares for you, that God loves you, that God's got you, and that, and that even in death, God still got you. That's what made the early church so amazing is they didn't fear death because they trusted so much in Jesus because some of them saw him die and then they saw him again, having conquered death, and they went, we don't have to be afraid of death. That's the kind of faith it takes to walk in peace when the world around us is still caught up in chaos. So it's not easy. It is, and it's not just one and done, like you just, you know, walk the aisle, put your faith in Jesus, get saved, quote unquote, whatever, however you were brought up to think of it, and then suddenly life is going to be great. No faith, it's an ongoing thing. It's a, it is a walk. We call it a faith walk for a reason. You got to walk it out. Walk it out till your time is done. And as you put your faith in Jesus that peace of God that says, okay, no matter what I see and experience, I trust in my heavenly father because he holds the world in his hands. And he is God. And if I let him be God in the big sense and also let him be God in my life and trust him with my life, then I can literally, I can walk out in peace. So here's what I suggest you do in uh, making peace with God. Number one, 
Acknowledge the sin in your past. Because some, some of us walk around with heaviness. Some of us walk around with a lot of guilt and condemnation because of the way we've been taught about God or just the way we have interpreted God. You, you do need to acknowledge sin of your past. Acknowledge it, confront it, confess it, all of that. And then, once you've acknowledged your sin, present yourself to God anyway. Because here's what happened. And I've, I see this play out in so many people's lives. I'm a pastor, so people will call on me often, thinking I'm supposed to have all the answers. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't. But they'll call me, and, and, and there's a life that's just lived and lived and lived, and they're so heavy, and they're so sorry for their life, and they're so uh, guilt-ridden because of their life and their past mistakes, and they'll, they'll say things like, I just need to get back in church, and not, you know, this ways that they think that would make them better, and yet they go on and on and on and on and on instead of running to God because of this concept of God that somehow they have to make peace with God, that it's on them, they, they end up running from God because they, they, they keep doing the same things over and over again. They can't get it together. They can't get it together. So they, if they think they've got to have it together to come to God, then they never come to God because they can't get it together. And I hate that. When I talk to people who are truly desperate for something better in their life, and that's the version of God they've been taught or they believe for some reason, I just want to go, no, please don't. Throw that God away. Throw that in the trash. That's a bunch of bovine residue. No, no, no. God's already made peace with you. Jesus died in about 33, 34 AD. It's already been done. If you'll trust in him, the person, you can present yourself to God, even in your sin. And then, trust that Jesus has made it okay. Trust that Jesus has, he, he's made it okay. And, and see, here, if, if you're a person who's a, a rule person, like you, you really got to have clarity, the black and white kind of thing of what I'm saying, if you'll start with faith and trust in Jesus and that reconciliation and peace with God that's already been provided for you, what you'll see is the transformation on the inside that makes it a lot easier to not continue down the same road. But don't try to fix yourself because when you try to fix yourself, you're playing God. You're playing God. And it's not your part to play. Only God can play that part in your life. So maybe this Christmas, for, for the rest of this Christmas time, and hopefully carrying over to after that as well, maybe you can get a different picture of God and, and finally just find that peace with God by finally trusting God that what Jesus did really did cover you as well. So I invite you to con consider that and to reflect on that, to think on that, and do know that we are here for you. If you, if you need help with that, we want to pray with you. We want to have a conversation with you, a cup of coffee or whatever you might need to process and deal with that. I know it's not as simple as I make it sound. It's easy to preach. It's easy to talk about. Sometimes it's hard to walk out. Please reach out to us. You can reach us through the Facebook. You can message us on the Facebook, on Messenger, or you can email from the website. It's all listed there for you on our website and our Facebook page. If you need help walking through what that really looks like for you, we want to be here for you and to help you do that. We don't do all try to do all that and make all that happen right here in the service because there's more to it than that. But please reach out to us if we can help you walk through this because I want everybody, everybody to experience that kind of peace where you don't have to worry about your past anymore and carry around that baggage. You don't have to. Let me pray for us. Lord, we just thank you that uh, 
this message is true. We thank you that you initiated it all and that when you saw the broken relationship and when you saw our mess and our brokenness, you didn't run away. You didn't turn your head the other way and turn away from us, but God, you stepped into the mess and you stepped into our world and you did that physically and literally through Jesus. And that's what we celebrate in this season, God. And we're so grateful for it, that you loved us enough to step into the mess that we created because you loved us that much. Lord, I pray that every person that hears this message can believe that for themselves. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. Appreciate you so much. Come back next week. We'll have part three, and we'll continue to celebrate this season and find the peace that we all long for. God bless you. Have a great week.